Okay, so you know how every neighborhood has that one dog that never shuts up? You've probably got one near you, a dog that barks at anything and everything, day and night. Well, in my neighborhood, that dog belonged to Mrs. Patterson. Now, Mrs. Patterson was one of those sweet old ladies who had been living on the same block for like a hundred years. She was the kind of neighbor who baked cookies for new families and hosted the annual block party. Her dog, Max, was a big German Shepherd mix, a real sweetheart when you met him up close, but from a distance, he was a terror. He barked at every leaf that blew by, every car that drove past, and God help you if you were a squirrel in his territory. So this story takes place about a year ago, when things started to get strange. It all began when Mrs. Patterson suddenly passed away. She'd been getting on in years, and one day, she just didn't wake up. Peaceful, they said, but the whole neighborhood was pretty shaken up. She was like our collective grandma, you know? Anyway, after she passed, her house sat empty for a while. No one came by, no relatives, nothing. The dog Max stayed in the backyard and people in the neighborhood took turns feeding him. But without Mrs. Patterson around, Max started barking even more, like nonstop. At first, everyone figured he was just confused, maybe lonely. But then things started to get weird. Neighbors began to notice that Max wasn't just barking randomly. He was barking at something, something in the backyard. Now I live right next door, so I had a front row seat to this. Every night, like clockwork, Max would start barking around 10 p.m., not just barking, howling, like he was terrified of something. And every time, he'd be facing the same spot in the yard, right by the old oak tree. At first, I didn't think much of it. Dogs bark, right? But after a few nights of this, I started to get curious. What was freaking Max out so much? So one night, I decided to go out and take a look. It's late, probably close to midnight, and the whole neighborhood is quiet except for Max. He's out there, howling his head off, standing rigid, staring at that same spot by the tree. I grab a flashlight, hop the fence into Mrs. Patterson's yard, and make my way over to where Max is. Now I'm not gonna lie, my heart's pounding a little. There's something about the way Max is acting that's setting me on edge. He's usually a friendly dog, but tonight he's in full guard mode. As I get closer, he doesn't even acknowledge me. His eyes are locked on the ground by the tree, and his fur is standing on end. I shine the flashlight where he's looking, but there's nothing there. Just some dirt, a few leaves, nothing unusual. I try to calm Max down, give him a little scratch behind the ears, but he's not having it. He just keeps barking, like he's warning me about something I can't see. I stand there for a while, feeling like an idiot, but eventually, I give up and head back inside. Max keeps barking for a few more hours before finally quieting down. I figure that's the end of it, but oh no, it's just the beginning. The next night, same thing. Max starts barking at 10 p.m., same spot by the tree. This time, I decide to stay inside and just watch from the window. And that's when I see it, something moving in the shadows. At first, I think it's just a trick of the light. But then I see it again, something dark, shifting just beyond the edge of the flashlight's beam. It's like a shadow, but thicker, almost solid, and it's moving closer to the tree. My first instinct is to grab my phone and call someone, but who the hell do you call for something like this? Instead, I just watch, frozen, as the shadow inches closer to Max. The dog is going nuts, barking and growling, but he doesn't move from his spot. He's protecting something, or someone. Then just as the shadow reaches the tree, it stops. And for a split second, I see something in the dark, two glowing eyes staring back at me. They're not human, not animal, just these cold, empty eyes looking right through me. And then, they're gone. The shadow melts back into the night, and Max finally stops barking. He's panting, exhausted, but he stays by the tree like he's keeping watch. I don't sleep that night. I'm too freaked out. What the hell did I just see? Was it my imagination? But the next day, things get even weirder. I'm out getting the mail when I see a couple of guys in suits walking up to Mrs. Patterson's house. They don't look like cops, more like, I don't know, government types. They've got this official vibe about them, 
They let themselves into the house, and I don't see them come out for hours. When they finally do, they're carrying something, something wrapped in a black tarp. It's big, and they're struggling with it. I try to get a better look, but they load it into the back of an unmarked van and take off before I can get close. That night, Max doesn't bark. The neighborhood is dead silent. And the next day, when I go out to check on him, Max is gone. The gate's locked. The yard is empty. No note, no explanation, nothing. I ask around, but no one knows what happened to Max. It's like he just vanished. I try calling animal control, shelters, even the local vet, but they have no record of picking up a dog from our street. It's like Max never existed. But here's the thing. I know what I saw. And I know that whatever was in that yard by that tree wasn't natural. I don't know what those guys in suits took out of Mrs. Patterson's house, but whatever it was, it's connected to Max's disappearance. And that shadow, those eyes, they still haunt me. I haven't seen them again, but every night I feel like something's watching me from the darkness, waiting. So yeah, be careful what you ignore, folks. Sometimes the things that go bump in the night are real and they're closer than you think. Katie was nine years old when she first attended Camp Cedarbrook, a picturesque summer camp nestled deep in the forests of New Hampshire. It was her first time away from home for more than a night, and she was both nervous and excited. Her parents had reassured her that she'd have a great time making new friends and learning new skills, and they were right. Katie loved it. But there was one counselor who stood out among the others, and not in a good way. His name was Steve, and he was in charge of the younger campers, including Katie's group. At first, Steve seemed friendly enough, always smiling and joking with the kids. But as the days went on, Katie started to feel uneasy around him. He was always there, always watching, always too close. Steve had a habit of singling out Katie always choosing her for activities, always sitting next to her at meals, always making sure she was in his group for hikes and campfires. Katie didn't know how to tell anyone that she didn't like it. She didn't want to seem ungrateful, and maybe she was just being silly. But something about Steve made her skin crawl. One night, after the campers had gone to bed, Katie was woken by the sound of footsteps outside her cabin. The moonlight filtered through the cracks in the wooden walls, casting long shadows across the room. Katie held her breath, listening. The footsteps stopped right outside the door. Katie's heart raced. She squeezed her eyes shut, hoping whoever it was would go away. But then the door creaked open, and Katie peeked out from under her blanket. Steve was standing in the doorway, his silhouette outlined by the pale moonlight. He stood there for what felt like an eternity, just watching the sleeping girls. Katie's stomach twisted in fear, but she didn't dare move, didn't dare make a sound. Finally, after what felt like forever, Steve quietly closed the door and walked away. Katie lay awake the rest of the night, too terrified to sleep. The next morning, she tried to convince herself it was just a bad dream, but she couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled in her chest. As the days went on, Steve's behavior became more unsettling. He always seemed to know where Katie was, always seemed to be watching her. When they played games, his touch lingered too long when he tagged her. When they went swimming, he always found an excuse to be near her in the water. Katie didn't know how to tell anyone. She felt like she was trapped in a nightmare, one she couldn't wake up from. But then, one evening, Steve crossed the line. It was the night of the big campfire, a highlight of the summer for all the campers. They gathered around the fire, singing songs, roasting marshmallows, and telling ghost stories. Katie sat with her friends, trying to enjoy the night, but she couldn't shake the feeling that Steve was watching her. As the fire burned low and the counselors began to usher the younger campers back to their cabins, Steve approached Katie and asked her to stay behind to help clean up. Katie's heart pounded in her chest, but she didn't know how to say no. She glanced around, hoping one of the other counselors would notice, but no one seemed to be paying attention. 
Steve led Katie away from the others, toward the edge of the woods where the shadows were deeper and the light from the fire didn't reach. He stopped and turned to face her, his smile cold and unsettling. You're a good girl, Katie, he said softly, his voice sending chills down her spine. You always do what you're told. Katie didn't know what to say. She just stood there, frozen in fear, as Steve reached out and gently brushed a strand of hair behind her ear. You know, I've been watching you, he continued, his hand lingering too close to her face. You're special, Katie. I think you and I could be great friends. Katie's stomach churned. She wanted to run, to scream, to get away from him, but her feet felt like they were glued to the ground. Steve leaned in closer, his breath hot on her face. But you have to promise me something, he whispered. You have to promise you'll always listen to me, no matter what. Can you do that? Katie nodded slowly, too terrified to do anything else. Steve smiled that cold, empty smile and patted her on the head. Good girl, he said, stepping back. Now why don't you head back to your cabin? I'll clean up here. Katie didn't need to be told twice. She turned and ran, not stopping until she was safely inside her cabin with the door shut tight behind her. She crawled into bed, her heart racing, and pulled the blanket over her head. She didn't sleep a wink that night, every creak and rustle outside making her jump. The next morning, Katie knew she had to do something. She couldn't keep living in fear, couldn't keep letting Steve control her. But she was too scared to tell any of the counselors, afraid they wouldn't believe her, or worse, that they would tell Steve. But then, during breakfast, she overheard some of the older campers whispering about Steve, about how he was always hanging around the younger girls, how he always seemed to be watching them. Katie's heart sank. She wasn't the only one. Steve was doing this to other girls, too. That night, Katie gathered her courage and told one of the older counselors what had been happening. She was shaking so badly she could barely get the words out, but once she started, the story came pouring out of her. The counselor listened, her face growing more serious with each passing moment. When Katie finished, the counselor put a reassuring hand on her shoulder. You did the right thing by telling me, she said. We're going to take care of this, Katie. You don't have to be afraid anymore. The next day, Steve was gone. Katie didn't know what happened to him, and she didn't care. All she knew was that she finally felt safe again. But the experience left a scar on Katie, one that never fully healed. Even years later, as an adult, she couldn't shake the feeling of someone watching her, of eyes following her every move. And sometimes late at night, when she was all alone, she could still hear Steve's voice in her head, whispering, You always do what you're told. Okay, so get this. I'm at the public library, just doing my usual weekend routine. You know, grabbing a coffee, wandering through the aisles, pretending like I'm cultured and all that. I love the smell of old books, the quiet hum of people pretending to be studious, and the comfy chairs in the corner that are perfect for dozing off with a book in your lap. Now the library I go to is one of those big old school places with towering shelves, high ceilings, and those little alcoves where you can hide away with a book and not be disturbed. It's a nice escape from the usual chaos of life, plus it's a great place to people watch. You'd be surprised at the kind of characters you see in a library. So I'm there, browsing the mystery section, looking for something new to read. I'm not picky, just something to kill a few hours. I spot this book on the top shelf, dusty, old, looks like it hasn't been touched in years. The title's worn off, but the spine is still intact, so I figure why not. I grab it, but as I'm pulling it down, another book falls off the shelf, almost like it was stuck to the one I grabbed. Now, here's where it gets weird. The book that fell is this nondescript, bland-looking thing. No title, no author, just a plain black cover. I pick it up, curious, and flip through the pages. It's blank. Every single page is blank, like a notebook that's never been used. At first, I'm like, okay, that's odd. But then I remember I'm in a library. Maybe it's some kind of artist's sketchbook that got misplaced. I'm about to put it back when I notice something 
The last page has something written on it, just a single line. It says, turn around. Now I'm not one to get spooked easily, but there's something about those two words that sends a chill down my spine. I'm in a library for crying out loud, not some haunted house, but still I get this uneasy feeling like I'm being watched. I slowly turn around expecting, I don't know what, maybe some prankster or a librarian giving me the stink eye for touching the old books, but there's no one there, just the empty aisle behind me. I shrug it off, convincing myself it's probably some kid's idea of a joke, and I head to one of those comfy chairs in the corner to check out the book I originally grabbed. But here's the thing, I can't focus. My eyes keep drifting back to that black book. It's sitting on the table next to me, and it's like I can feel it staring at me, if that makes any sense. I give in to the weird vibe and pick it up again. This time, I flip through it slower, looking for anything else that might be written. But it's all blank, except for that last page. The words turn around seem darker now, almost like they've been freshly written. I put the book down, trying to shake off the unease, and go back to my original choice. But I swear, every time I look away from that black book, it feels like it's getting closer, like it's moving on its own. I'm not crazy, I know what you're thinking, but seriously, every time I glance at it, it seems to be just a little closer to the edge of the table, like it's inching toward me. And then, the damn thing falls off the table, just drops to the floor with a thud, making me jump out of my skin. I pick it up, ready to chuck it back on the shelf and get the hell out of there, but the page with the writing catches my eye again. The words have changed. Now it says, take me home. Yeah, no thanks. But here's the thing, I can't just leave it there. I don't know why, but I feel like if I don't take it, something bad's gonna happen. It's like the book's got some kind of hold on me. So, against my better judgment, I stuff it in my bag and make a beeline for the exit. I get home and I'm telling myself the whole way that I'm gonna just toss the book in the trash or maybe burn it. But once I'm back in my apartment, I can't do it. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I just can't bring myself to get rid of it. Instead, I put it on my bookshelf, way in the back, behind some old cookbooks I never use. For the next few days, I try to forget about it, but I can't. It's like the book is always in the back of my mind, nagging at me. I start having weird dreams, nothing specific, just dark, unsettling stuff. Waking up in a cold sweat kind of dreams. Then. One night, I wake up in the middle of the night, and I hear this rustling sound. At first, I think it's coming from outside, but then I realize it's inside my apartment. My heart's pounding as I get up to check it out. I'm expecting to find a rat or something, but instead, I see it. The black book lying open on the floor in the hallway. I know I didn't leave it there. I don't even remember touching it since I put it on the shelf. But there it is open to a page that's definitely not blank anymore. This time, the message is longer. It says, you can't leave. I'm done. I grab the book, throw it in a trash bag, and take it straight down to the dumpster outside my building. I'm not messing around with this thing anymore, but when I get back to my apartment, I can't sleep. I keep hearing that rustling sound, even though the book's gone. I turn on every light, checking every corner of the place, but there's nothing there. Just the sound, getting louder, more insistent. And then I hear it, a knock at my door. It's the middle of the night, and someone's knocking. I'm not expecting anyone, so I'm hesitant, but I go to check. I open the door a crack, and there's nothing. No one there. But when I look down, there it is. The black book, lying on my welcome mat like it found its way back on its own. I don't know what to do. It's like this book is cursed, and now it's attached to me. I grab it, slam the door shut, and this time, I don't just throw it away. I drive out to the middle of nowhere, to this old abandoned lot, and bury it as deep as I can in the dirt. I'm talking full on digging a hole in the middle of the night, like some kind of lunatic. When I'm done, I drive home, exhausted but relieved. I figure, that's it. I've finally gotten rid of it. But here's the twist, and I'm not even joking. The next morning I wake up and there's dirt on my floor just a little bit, like someone tracked it in from outside. 
And when I go to check my bookshelf, there it is, back in its spot, sitting there like it never left. The page is open again with a new message. This time it says, we're not done yet. And that, my friends, is where I'm at right now. I don't know what this book wants, but it's not letting go. And the scariest part, I'm starting to think I don't want it to. Okay, picture this. We're in a small, quiet town in the U.S., the kind where everyone knows everyone, or at least thinks they do. People wave from their front porches, kids ride their bikes down tree-lined streets, and the local diner still serves coffee for a buck. Life here is about as typical as it gets. It's a place where nothing ever happens, until it does. Enter our main character, Jason. He's 27, works at a local tech startup, and is living that post-college life where everything feels a bit in between. You know the deal. Too old to be a carefree kid, but not quite settled enough to feel like a real adult. He's got a decent apartment, a handful of close friends, and a routine that mostly revolves around work, the gym, and the occasional night out at the local bar. Now Jason's not exactly the social media type. He's got the usual accounts, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but he's not one to post every detail of his life. He checks in occasionally, maybe shares a meme or two, but that's about it. For him, social media is more of a background noise, something to scroll through when he's bored. But that's where our story starts. One night, Jason's chilling on his couch, scrolling through Facebook, when he gets a friend request. Nothing unusual, right? Except this one's from a woman named Emily Ross. The name doesn't ring a bell, but the profile picture catches his eye. It's a girl about his age, with wavy brown hair and a warm smile, standing in front of some beach at sunset. The kind of picture that's meant to look casual, but probably took a dozen tries to get just right. Jason figures she's someone he might have met at a party or through mutual friends, so he accepts the request without giving it much thought. A minute later, he gets a message. Hey Jason, long time no see. How have you been? Okay, now he's confused. He doesn't remember meeting an Emily Ross, let alone being close enough to warrant a message like that. He racks his brain, trying to place her, but nothing comes to mind. Maybe she's one of those people who adds everyone they meet and just assumes you'll remember them. So he replies, keeping it vague. Hey, I'm good, thanks. How about you? She responds almost immediately, which, let's be honest, is a little weird. I'm doing great. Just moved back to town. We should catch up sometime. Now Jason's really stumped. Moved back? Did she used to live here? Did he go to school with her? He checks out her profile, but there's not much to go on. Just a few pictures, all pretty generic, and no mutual friends. Red flag? Maybe. But it's not like she's asking for money or anything, so he figures it's harmless. Still, something about this feels off. So he does what any of us would do. He asks his friends. He sends a screenshot of her profile to his group chat, asking if anyone knows her. The responses are all variations of, nope, never heard of her, and are you sure you didn't meet her when you were drunk? Jason laughs it off, but there's a nagging feeling he can't quite shake. It's like his brain's trying to tell him something, but the signal's all fuzzy. He decides to leave it alone for now. People forget stuff all the time, right? But then things get stranger. Over the next few days, Emily starts liking almost everything Jason posts. Old photos, random status updates, even comments he made on other people's posts. It's like she's going through his entire Facebook history. Creepy? Definitely. But again, nothing too crazy. Just weird. Jason mentions it to his friends, but they just tease him about his Facebook stalker. One of them jokes, Maybe she's your soulmate, dude. Better ask her out before she shows up at your door with a wedding ring. Everyone laughs, but Jason can't shake the uneasy feeling in his gut. A week goes by, and Jason almost forgets about Emily until he gets another message from her. Hey, I'm in your neighborhood. Wanna grab a coffee? Okay, hold up. How does she know where he lives? Jason's never mentioned his address on Facebook, and they haven't talked about where either of them lives. Now his alarm bells are ringing loud and clear. 
but instead of confronting her, he decides to play it cool. Sure, where are you thinking? He replies, trying to keep things casual while he figures out what to do. She sends him the address of a coffee shop a few blocks away. Jason's been there a couple of times. It's a popular spot, always crowded. Safe enough, right? He tells her he'll meet her there in an hour, but as soon as he sends the message, he starts to feel like this is a really bad idea. He considers bailing, but his curiosity gets the better of him. He needs to figure out who this girl is and what she wants. So, he heads to the coffee shop, arriving a little early to scope the place out. When he walks in, it's the usual scene, students on laptops, couples chatting, baristas hustling behind the counter, but no sign of Emily. He grabs a seat by the window where he can see the entrance, orders a coffee, and waits. Half an hour goes by, then an hour. No Emily. Jason's starting to feel like an idiot. Maybe she stood him up, or maybe this was some kind of joke. Either way, he's annoyed and about to leave when his phone buzzes with a new message from her. Sorry, running late. Be there in ten. He sighs, leaning back in his chair. All right, ten more minutes, and then he's out of here. But ten minutes pass, then twenty, and still no sign of her. Another message comes in. Actually, I'm outside your apartment. Thought I'd surprise you. Jason's stomach drops. He stares at the message, heart pounding. How the hell does she know where he lives? He looks around the coffee shop, feeling exposed, vulnerable. She's not here, and she's not coming. Jason jumps up, ditches his half-drunk coffee, and bolts out the door. His mind's racing as he speed walks the few blocks back to his apartment. When he reaches his building, he hesitates. What if she's really out there, waiting for him? He takes a deep breath and rounds the corner to his entrance. But there's no one there. The street's quiet, no sign of Emily or anyone else lurking around. Jason fumbles with his keys, his hands shaking, and hurries inside, locking the door behind him. He stands there for a moment, trying to calm his racing heart. He feels ridiculous. This whole thing is probably some bizarre misunderstanding. But he can't shake the feeling that something's very wrong. Jason decides to block Emily on Facebook, but when he pulls up her profile, it's gone. Just like that. Like she never existed. No messages, no friend requests, nothing. His heart sinks further. Did he imagine the whole thing? Was this some elaborate prank? The next day, Jason's on edge. He's jumpy at work, distracted, constantly checking his phone for any sign of Emily. But there's nothing. No messages, no missed calls, no sightings. It's like she's vanished into thin air. A few days later, things start to go back to normal. Jason's feeling a little silly about how freaked out he got. He tells himself it was probably just some scam or catfishing attempt, and he got lucky by not getting sucked into it. But just as he's starting to relax, something happens that makes his blood run cold. It's a Saturday afternoon, and Jason's out for a jog, trying to clear his head. He's a few blocks from his apartment when he sees something that stops him in his tracks. On the sidewalk just a few feet away is a flyer taped to a lamp post. It's a missing persons poster. And staring back at him from the photo is Emily Ross. Jason feels like the ground's been yanked out from under him. He stumbles closer, his heart pounding in his ears. The poster says Emily's been missing for three months. There's a phone number to call if anyone has information, and a plea from her family for any help they can get. His hands are shaking as he pulls out his phone and takes a picture of the flyer. He wants to call the number, tell them everything, but his mind's a mess of confusion and fear. How could she be missing when she'd just been messaging him days ago? How could she know where he lived? Jason rushes home, his thoughts spiraling. Once he's inside, he locks the door and pulls up the picture of the flyer on his phone. He stares at it, trying to make sense of it all. Then, with a shaking hand, he dials the number on the poster. It rings for a few agonizing seconds before a woman answers. Her voice is tired, broken. Hello? Uh, hi, Jason stammers. I, but I think I have some information about Emily Ross. There's a pause, and then the woman says, Please, anything you know, we're desperate. Jason explains everything. The friend request, the messages, the coffee shop, the fact that she knew where he lived. 
As he's talking, the woman starts to cry. That's not possible, she says, her voice trembling. Emily, Emily's been gone for three months. She was last seen near her apartment, and then she just disappeared. The police think, they think something happened to her, something bad. Jason's heart feels like it's about to explode. But I've been talking to her, he insists. She messaged me. She knew things. No, the woman cuts him off, her voice choked with tears. That's not Emily. It can't be. She's gone. Please, please don't call here again. The line goes dead. Jason stands there, staring at his phone, his mind spinning. None of this makes any sense. How could she be missing, dead even, and still be contacting him? And then it hits him. Maybe it wasn't Emily. Maybe it was someone or something else, using her name, her face, to get to him. But why? What did they want? Jason doesn't have an answer, but one thing's for sure. He's not safe. He deletes his Facebook account, changes his number, even considers moving. But no matter what he does, he can't shake the feeling that he's being watched, that something's following him, waiting for him to let his guard down. And then, just when he's starting to think he might be in the clear, it happens again. He's sitting in his apartment one evening, trying to relax with some Netflix, when he gets a notification. It's an email from an address he doesn't recognize. The subject line reads, We haven't finished yet. Jason's hands are trembling as he opens it. The message is short, just two words, check outside. He bolts up, heart racing, and rushes to the window. At first, he doesn't see anything, just the usual quiet street, but then his eyes catch something out of place, a figure standing in the shadows across the road, half hidden behind a tree. It's a woman, and even in the dim light, Jason can tell it's Emily, or at least it looks like her. Jason backs away from the window, his heart pounding. He knows he should call someone, do something, but he's frozen, paralyzed by fear. The figure doesn't move, just stands there, staring up at his apartment. And that's when he realizes there's no escape. Whoever or whatever Emily is, she's not going to stop. She's found him once and she'll find him again. Because this isn't about friendship or love or anything else Jason can understand. It's about something far darker, far more terrifying. Something that's not going to let him go. Jason doesn't sleep that night. And the next morning, when he finally works up the courage to check outside, the figure is gone. But he knows she'll be back. As time goes on, Jason starts to see her everywhere. In reflections, in crowds, in the corner of his eye. She's always there, just out of reach, just out of sight, waiting. And no matter how far he runs, how hard he tries to escape, he knows one thing for sure. He'll never be rid of her. Because Emily, or whatever she is, has chosen him. And once you've been chosen, there's no going back. Sarah had always been an early riser. There was something about the quiet hours of the morning that she cherished, when the world was still asleep and the day's potential stretched out before her. She would make herself a cup of coffee, sit by the kitchen window, and watch the sun slowly rise casting a warm glow over her suburban neighborhood. It was a routine she had kept for years, a small comfort in the midst of life's chaos. But lately, something felt off. It was nothing she could put her finger on, just a sense of unease that gnawed at the edges of her mind. She brushed it off as stress. Work had been particularly demanding lately, and her sleep had been restless at best. One morning, as she sipped her coffee and stared out the window, she noticed something strange. Across the street, in the yard of the old Johnson house, there was a figure standing in the shadows. At first, she thought it was a trick of the light, a shadow cast by the trees. But as she squinted, she realized it was a man, tall and still, almost blending into the background. Sarah's heart skipped a beat. The Johnson house had been empty for months ever since the elderly couple who lived there had passed away. The property had fallen into disrepair, with overgrown grass and peeling paint, a stark contrast to the well-kept homes around it. She leaned closer to the window, trying to get a better look at the man. He was facing the house, his back to her, and he didn't move. For a moment, Sarah considered calling out to him, but something held her back, 
a deep, instinctual fear that told her to stay quiet. Instead, she watched him for a few more minutes, her coffee growing cold in her hands. But the man didn't move, didn't turn around. It was as if he were rooted to the spot, a dark silhouette against the pale dawn. Eventually, she tore her eyes away and decided to start her day. But the image of the man stayed with her, a nagging worry that she couldn't shake. She checked the window several times throughout the day, but the man was gone. The yard was empty, just as it had been for months. The next morning, Sarah woke up with a sense of dread she couldn't explain. She made her coffee and hesitated before looking out the window. When she finally did, her blood ran cold. The man was back. This time, he was closer to the house, almost at the front door. He was still as a statue, his head slightly bowed as if he were staring at something on the ground. Sarah's heart raced as she watched him, her mind spinning with questions. Who was he? Why was he there? And why did he make her feel so uneasy? She picked up her phone, her fingers hovering over the screen as she debated calling the police. But what would she say? That there was a man standing in front of an empty house? That she felt uneasy? It sounded ridiculous, even to her. So she put the phone down and tried to focus on her day. But as the hours passed, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was very wrong. The next morning, Sarah was almost too afraid to look out the window, but curiosity got the better of her and she couldn't resist. She pulled back the curtain and gasped. The man was even closer now, standing on the porch of the Johnson house. His head was still bowed, his face obscured by the shadow of the roof. Sarah's hands trembled as she watched him, a sense of dread settling in the pit of her stomach. She knew she had to do something. This wasn't normal. It wasn't right. She grabbed her phone and dialed the non-emergency line for the police. As she explained the situation, she felt a wave of relief. Finally, someone would come and take care of this. The operator assured her that an officer would be sent to check it out, and Sarah hung up, feeling a little better. She kept an eye on the window, waiting for the police to arrive. But when they did, the man was gone. The officer knocked on her door, and she quickly explained what she had seen. He listened patiently, nodding as she spoke, but she could tell he didn't believe her. He offered to check the property just to be sure, and Sarah agreed, though she already knew what he would find. Nothing. Sure enough, the officer returned a few minutes later, confirming that the house was empty. He assured her it was probably just a drifter or someone passing through, and that there was nothing to worry about. But as he drove away, Sarah couldn't shake the feeling that he was wrong. The next morning, Sarah didn't even bother making coffee. She went straight to the window, her heart pounding in her chest. She pulled back the curtain and felt her stomach drop. The man was gone but the front door of the Johnson house was wide open. Sarah's blood turned to ice. She stared at the open door, her mind racing with possibilities. Had the man gone inside? Was he still there? She grabbed her phone and dialed the police again, her hands shaking so badly she could barely press the buttons. This time, the police didn't brush her off. They sent two officers to check the house, and Sarah watched anxiously from her window as they searched the property. After what felt like an eternity, they emerged, shaking their heads. There's no one inside, ma'am, one of the officers told her when she opened the door. But the place has been ransacked. Looks like someone broke in, but they're long gone now. Sarah nodded, feeling a mix of relief and fear. Relief that the man was gone, but fear that he had been inside the house, so close to her own home. The officers left, promising to keep an eye on the neighborhood but Sarah knew it wouldn't be enough. She couldn't stay here, not with that man, whoever he was, still out there. She packed a bag that night and left the house, staying with a friend on the other side of town. She couldn't bear the thought of being alone, not after everything that had happened. It took weeks before Sarah felt safe enough to return home. By then, the Johnson house had been boarded up, the yard overgrown with weeds. But even with the house sealed off, Sarah couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched, that the man was still out there, waiting. And sometimes late at night, 
She would catch a glimpse of a shadow moving across the street, just out of the corner of her eye. She would turn to look, but there would be nothing there. But deep down, Sarah knew he was still watching, waiting for the right moment to return. Michael was spending his summer at home in New Jersey, preparing for his senior year of college. His parents had gone on a month-long trip to Europe, leaving him alone in the house. It was a quiet suburban neighborhood with tree-lined streets and perfectly manicured lawns, the kind of place where nothing ever happened. Michael was a night owl. Most nights, he'd stay up late working on his laptop, playing video games, or watching movies. His desk was positioned right next to his bedroom window, which faced the street. From his seat, he could see anyone walking by, and they could see him too. It was during one of these late night sessions that Michael first noticed the woman. She appeared suddenly, walking slowly down the sidewalk, her long dark hair swaying slightly with each step. She looked to be in her late twenties or early thirties, wearing a pale dress that seemed out of place in the modern world. What really caught Michael's attention was her smile, a wide, unnerving grin that never left her face. At first, Michael didn't think much of it. He glanced at her out of the corner of his eye, then returned to his work. But over the next few nights, he saw her again and again and again. She walked by his window multiple times each evening, her smile always fixed, her eyes always locked on him. Michael found it strange, but not alarming. Maybe she was just someone from the neighborhood, taking late-night walks to clear her mind. But as the days passed, her presence became more frequent. She began appearing five, ten, fifteen times a night, always walking slowly, always smiling. One evening, while engrossed in a project, Michael looked up to find the woman standing completely still in front of his house. She was staring directly into his window, her eyes boring into him with that same unsettling smile. Michael's heart skipped a beat. He quickly closed his laptop, pulled the curtains shut, and tried to ignore the growing sense of unease gnawing at him. The doorbell rang. Michael froze, his pulse quickening. He wasn't expecting anyone, especially not at this hour. He crept downstairs, his footsteps barely making a sound on the wooden floor, and peered through the peephole. There she was, standing on his porch, still smiling. Michael's blood ran cold. She didn't knock or call out, just stood there, grinning at the door. After what felt like an eternity, he mustered the courage to speak. Who are you? What do you want? He called through the door. The woman's smile widened, if that was even possible. Now it's your turn, she said, her voice sweet and melodic, like a child's lullaby. Michael didn't respond. He just stood there, staring at the door, his mind racing. What did she mean? Your turn? Was this some kind of prank? A sick joke? Suddenly, the woman burst into laughter, a high-pitched, maniacal cackle that sent shivers down Michael's spine. He backed away from the door, nearly tripping over his feet in his haste to get away from the sound. Without another word, he ran back upstairs, locked himself in his bedroom, and tried to calm his racing heart. For the rest of the night, Michael stayed in his room, too afraid to sleep, too terrified to move. He kept his phone close, but he didn't dare call the police. What would he say? A strange woman was laughing on his porch. They'd think he was crazy. The next morning, Michael hesitantly opened the door to find the porch empty, the street deserted. The woman was gone. For the first time in weeks, he felt a wave of relief wash over him. Maybe it was all just a bad dream, some bizarre figment of his imagination. But then the doorbell rang again. This time, Michael didn't hesitate. He grabbed his phone and called his parents, hoping they might know something about this strange woman. His mother answered, her voice chipper and cheerful as always. Hey, Michael, how's everything at home? She asked. There's this woman. Michael began, his voice shaky. She's been hanging around the house every night. She's really creepy, Mom. Do you know anything about her? There was a long pause on the other end of the line. Michael could hear his mother whispering something to his father, but the words were too muffled to make out. Finally, his mother spoke again, her voice strained. Michael, don't open the door. Whatever you do, don't let her in. 
What? Why? Michael demanded, his fear mounting. She's dangerous, his mother whispered. Years ago, before we moved here, there was a woman in the neighborhood who became obsessed with the house. She claimed she had some sort of connection with the people living there, like she could communicate with them telepathically. The police got involved, and eventually she was taken away to a mental hospital. We thought she was gone for good, but Michael's stomach dropped. But what? She must have found out we moved into the house, his mother said, her voice trembling. She must think you're the person she was connected to. Michael's mind raced. He looked out the window, half expecting to see the woman standing there, but the street was empty. What do I do? He asked, panic creeping into his voice. Stay inside, his mother instructed. Lock all the doors and windows. We'll call the police and try to get home as soon as we can. Michael hung up the phone, his hands shaking. He locked every door, every window, pulling the curtains tight to block out the outside world. Hours passed in tense silence, and just when Michael began to think the woman might not return, the doorbell rang again. He didn't answer it. He didn't move. But as the minutes ticked by, the ringing became more insistent, more frantic, until it was joined by the sound of pounding on the door. Michael's heart pounded in his chest as he dialed 911. There's someone trying to break into my house, he whispered, his voice barely audible. The operator assured him that the police were on their way, but Michael could barely hear her over the sound of the woman's laughter, now echoing through the house like a twisted melody. The pounding grew louder, more violent, until it suddenly stopped. The silence was deafening and Michael dared to hope that she was gone. But then, from the other side of the door, he heard her voice, soft and menacing. Now it's your turn, Michael. The door slowly creaked open. Megan had always dreamed of moving to the countryside. The idea of peaceful mornings, the scent of fresh grass, and the space to breathe away from the city's hustle was too appealing to resist. So, when she found a charming, albeit slightly run-down, farmhouse for sale in rural Pennsylvania, she didn't hesitate. The previous owners had left in a hurry, selling the place for a price that was almost too good to be true. Megan dismissed any doubts, attributing their hasty departure to personal reasons she had no interest in discovering. All she cared about was starting a new chapter of her life, away from the chaos she had known. The first few weeks were blissful. Megan spent her days unpacking, painting walls, and rearranging furniture to make the house truly hers. She found solace in the quiet evenings, sipping tea on the porch while watching the sun dip below the horizon. But as she settled into her new routine, strange things began to happen. It started with the noises. At night, as she lay in bed, Megan would hear faint creaks and groans echoing through the house. She chalked it up to the old structure settling, though sometimes the noises sounded too deliberate, too human. One night, as she was drifting off to sleep, she was jolted awake by a loud thud from the kitchen. Her heart raced. But after a moment of listening to the silence that followed, she convinced herself it was nothing and forced herself back to sleep. But the unease lingered. Megan's days began to blur into each other. She found herself growing more paranoid, constantly checking the locks and peering out of windows. Her nerves were on edge, though she couldn't pinpoint why. Then one evening, as she was unpacking a box of kitchenware, she noticed something odd. A thick layer of dust had settled on the countertops, despite having cleaned the entire kitchen just the day before. Confused, she wiped it away and moved on. That night, she awoke to the sound of footsteps. They were faint, almost imperceptible, but there was no mistaking them. Megan held her breath, straining to listen. The steps were slow and deliberate, moving from one end of the hallway to the other, just outside her bedroom door. She wanted to scream, but fear held her voice hostage. Slowly, she reached for her phone on the nightstand, her trembling fingers barely able to grasp it. The footsteps stopped abruptly, and the silence that followed was deafening. Megan's heart pounded in her chest as she stared at the door, waiting for it to creak open. 
but nothing happened. Hours passed, or maybe it was just minutes. It was hard to tell. Eventually, exhaustion overtook her, and she drifted off into a restless sleep. The next morning, Megan tried to convince herself it was just her imagination. The farmhouse was old, after all. Maybe the sounds were just the house settling, or perhaps an animal had gotten inside. But the unease in her stomach told her otherwise. She decided to distract herself by exploring the property. The farmhouse sat on several acres of land, most of it covered in dense woods. As she wandered through the trees, she came across a small, overgrown path she hadn't noticed before. Curious, she followed it until she reached a clearing. In the center of the clearing stood a dilapidated shed, its wooden boards weathered and rotting. Megan hesitated, but something compelled her to move closer. She pushed open the door, which creaked loudly in protest, and peered inside. The shed was empty, save for a few old tools and a dusty workbench. But as she turned to leave, something caught her eye, a small, tattered notebook lying on the floor. She picked it up and flipped through the pages. The handwriting was messy, almost frantic, and the entries were short, disjointed. They spoke of strange noises, of feeling watched, of shadows that moved on their own. The last entry sent a chill down her spine. It's in the house. I can hear it breathing. I'm not alone. Megan dropped the notebook, her hands trembling. She needed to get out of there, to leave this place, and never look back. But as she turned to run, she heard it, a low guttural growl coming from the trees behind her. She froze, her heart pounding in her chest. Slowly, she turned around. The clearing was empty, but the sense of being watched was overwhelming. Megan backed away, her eyes scanning the tree line for any sign of movement. Then, without warning, a figure emerged from the shadows, a tall, gaunt man with hollow eyes and a twisted smile. He stepped closer, his movements slow and deliberate, as if savoring the fear in her eyes. Megan's mind screamed at her to run, but her body refused to move. The man reached out a hand, his fingers long and bony, and whispered, You're mine now. That was all it took. Megan turned and sprinted back down the path, not daring to look back. She burst into the farmhouse, slamming the door behind her, and collapsed on the floor, gasping for breath. She didn't sleep that night, or the next. The noises continued, louder and more frequent, until she could no longer ignore the truth. She wasn't alone in the house. Something or someone was watching her, waiting for the right moment to strike. Megan packed her bags and left the farmhouse, never to return. She moved back to the city, where the noise and chaos were a welcome comfort. But no matter how far she ran, she could never escape the feeling of being watched, of that twisted smile lurking just out of sight.